So um, I'm honored to be here and excited to share with you tonight. And as I was preparing this, um, there was a lot of statements about I, 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 I. So I want to just like embrace this whole talk with the understanding that the I happened because God was enabling me and allowing me and directing me. And there was godly leadership in my life from our church family and also my husband who took seriously um, and still does his spiritual leadership, but also um, that I would be able to stand and give a, a good account um, when I stand before my Lord. So he encouraged and allows me to serve, and it even heaps some craziness in his own life. So um, all of that caveat has to be under that umbrella. So, and what I want to do mostly tonight is to encourage you, um, because I think if I remember, even though it's been a long time ago, um, this is kind of a scary time of life. You know, it's like I got to get it right and I have to do this right. And I want you to know that God doesn't waste anything. And so that is the beauty of being as old as I am, to be able to look back in your life and actually see that that's true, that God does not waste anything. Um, he is ultimately faithful, and you can trust in him, and he just asks you to be faithful, and he will equip you to do so. So it's a pretty good deal. Um, so I'm going to start with the most important thing, uh, was my salvation. Uh, fortunately, uh, I was blessed to be raised in a Christian home. I know people find that kind of trite, but it's very true, because at an early age, when I was in first grade, um, it was a very apparent the Lord was calling me because I was under great conviction, and I just had to be saved, because I knew I was not saved. I was not like the rest of my family. Um, I didn't, of course, at that age, understand the full picture, but it, that definitely was the, the saving grace. And I was baptized by immersion and then joined our, my local church there. Um, throughout my high school years, um, I, I was uh, fortunate to grow. However, we were in a denomination that taught that you could lose your salvation. So I spent most of my time worrying about whether I was saved rather than growing, which is a very scary way to live. So I'm very thankful that that's been settled. Um, and then I went off to college. And uh, as Nick said, um, I'm a Purdue alum. My degree is in chemical engineering. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was a long time ago. So long ago, I even still did key punch cards for computers. That's how old I am. Yeah. So I was the last year the freshman class had to do that. Um, and then in college, um, unfortunately, um, I guess I was just lazy with my spiritual walk. Um, we attended um, a, a student foundation that we could just walk to. I didn't have a car, so I used that as an excuse to not find a local church that was vib vibrant and teaching. Um, so that was pretty much, I was pretty much just in academic. Uh, there was some teaching, but looking back, I'm really sad that I didn't use those years to really grow and to develop some um, more closeness with God. But he was patient and he was faithful. Um, shortly after, um, right after I was, um, after I graduated, um, my husband and I got married, and he was still in school, and um, thankfully, he um, took his spiritual leadership very serious, and he decided we needed a real church. So um, we, this was before the internet, we opened up the phone book and started going through the Baptist churches, because we were raised Baptist, and that's what, we didn't really understand why we were Baptist, but that's what we did. So uh, fortunately, faith was... Um, uh, third on the list, no, second on the list. Uh, we went on our honeymoon one Sunday. The next Sunday, we were um, at the, the first church in the alphabet on the, the listing, and then the third week, we were at Faith, and it happened to be the, um, the picnic. So, uh, you know, we were just in all of this church. Um, but actually, my husband uh, said this is where we needed to be. I wasn't so sure. But thankfully, the Lord allowed me to be submissive, and I went, and I'm very thankful because of the teaching that we have had here. Um, and then at that time, I started working because he was still in school, and I had graduated, and I started working as a chemical engineer, actually a process engineer, at a local factory that's no longer in business. Maybe I helped shut the doors. I don't know. <laughs> but it was, um, it was General Foods, which is no longer in existence. It was bought out eventually by Kraft Foods, and we made uh, uh, Jell-O actually in the package jello and pudding and um, we made stovetop stuffing and I was actually in the frozen novelty department so those were popsicles it was really a big thing frozen novelties went in the mid 80s so um, we um, I got to eat fresh popsicles right off of the packaging line nothing ever tastes better but 
Um, and so at that point, they decided to close. After I'd worked there for a while as a process engineer, then I was a warehouse supervisor. Um, then the uh, doors closed, and I was pregnant with my first, and so they paid me to quit. And so everyone else, you know, everyone else was sad. Their whole world was upside down because I, I was happy because um, I got a severance. So when they announced the closing, I was like, yes. But I tried to be discreet. Um, so through that whole time, we were growing at Faith. Um, God was being faithful, providing service opportunities for us. Uh, some of the first things that we did, um, I was always in charge of feeding people. Um, so um, back in those days, it was just a lot different the way we do things now. Um, but we did the living nativity food. We did VBS snacks. Um, we did some other meals. Whenever there was a meal time, I was there. It became pretty, pretty, uh, pretty soon very apparent that administration was my spiritual gift because I loved organizing things. And I still love organizing things. But one of the really cool things for you to understand is, did you know that people move just like fluid particles and pipes. So I just got really a, good, a big kick out of doing traffic patterns and traffic flows, thinking about you know, how, how particles would happen in a pipe. I know, you engineers will understand, the rest of you think I'm weird. So a uh, guy was even using all of that training to help me serve him and his people. Um, then we started spending a lot of time teaching children in uh, Wednesday night clubs and in the twos and threes and in the threes and fours. And then, lo and behold, um, guess what happened next? They asked us to be in charge of the nursery. And for those of you who think about nursery, I, I thought you probably needed the spiritual gift of mercy, maybe, you know, <laughs> about these little kids. Um, but after we started serving, it was like, no, you know, it needed administration because it was the largest ministry with the volunteers. So that taught me that um, when you get busy serving, it becomes very obvious where your spiritual gifts are. And God will use that spiritual gift in, say, an area that you have a, maybe a passion about, but you might not think that spiritual gift's needed. Most of the ministries are big enough. We need all spiritual gifts in all ministries. So that was a big encouragement that I didn't have to like, know exactly what I was supposed to be doing. If there was a need and I could meet it, um, God was going to give the right gifted people to make that happen. Um, then after that, um, so I worked a lot with volunteers in the nursery. Then I, we did the human resources position, which is uh, Sherry Street Matter does that now. I don't know if you guys have, are aware of that one. Basically, it's to help connect people in places to serve. So the person in human resources tries to keep track of all the new people coming into the church family and as well as the different ministry options. So we did that for a while. Um, and then what was happening out in, when I was serving the community led me to realize I needed to be um, certified in counseling. So I pursued at that time it was NANC. So now I am ACBC certified, and I always have to write that down because I can't remember what the new initials are. <laughs> um, and then uh, now I am currently serving in the food pantry. When people come into the um, food pantry for the first time, they have to have an interview, and we sit down and try to evaluate their needs and encourage them to plug into some of the church ministries that can meet some of those needs. Um, it's just a, a, it's a hard time because people are hurting when they come in and sit down. There's usually tears. Um, but it's a blessing because I can usually pray with them. Um, I do that in the afternoons on Tuesdays, and then Mike Hines does that in the morning, and then, then there are other volunteers that actually put the food together. Uh, so that's something I do with, uh, in the food pantry. Um, and all of this is building, and all of this is building. You'll see how God works this all together. So in the community, so I, these are not like chronological, these are parallel. So in the community, I, we were homeschooling the kids. We did it for all three years, all three years, all three kids, all the, the whole time, a long time. And I apparently don't know, I don't know how to do math apparently anymore. Um, so in there, um, I had to learn to do things on the computer because remember I was the key punch person uh, because there were projects that had to be done in far as running that administration. So I had to learn how to do projects on the computer. I had to um, work with a lot of people in different areas from different walks of life. I had to uh, learn how to build an organization uh, because we did a speech and debate club that wasn't there before. Um, and then um, we decided to be foster parents too because we really liked parenting and the kids were getting older and we just thought, you know, there's hurting kids out there and we would like to parent them. And well, you know, if you like chaos, Foster parenting is for you. If chaos is probably not your best friend, foster parenting is really hard for you. But that's okay because God bless that time we were able to 
see our sinful and selfish hearts, and we were, he still blessed us in allowing us to have a relationship with uh, the biological families of the kids that we fostered. Um, and so that, that's just been a huge blessing to see what, where those kids are and to know that they're still okay. Um, but the problem with foster parenting, we really took from James 1, the passage where it says, this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God of our fathers that you visit the widows and orphans in their distress. We were stressing the word visit. Um, so we weren't going to take children into our home anymore. So I became what's called a CASA, which is a court-appointed uh, special advocate. This person um, actually is a champion for a child who is in um, a case with the Department of Child Services. So if, say, a child's removed from the home, they're in foster care. The kids kind of fall th by the wayside sometimes, and so uh, the CASA actually stays involved in the case and is a voice for that child. Um, there's quite a bit of training, which you have to learn the different social agencies in the, in the county. Um, and so, for example, just to give you an example of what happened, one of the little girls that I was a CASA for, there was a requirement that anyone that had any contact with that child had to have a background check. And that meant even if she did like a slumber party, a sleepover at a friend's, everyone in that house had to have a background check. So this child is, I think she's 10, maybe 9 at the time. Not only is her world upside down, but now she can't go to anybody's house or everyone has to know all the business and have to have a background check. So I appealed to the judge to please, you know, if we trust these people to take care of these children, we ought to be able to trust them as far as who, who they're with. So the little girl got to go to a slumber party, was the bottom line. So that, that's the kind of stuff that a CASA gets to do and make recommendations to the judge about the care of the child. Um, but the problem with CASA was, by that time, I, I was very, we were, Jeff and I were really frustrated because by that time the family is already broken. You know, no matter what you do at that point, there is just brokenness. Not that God can't redeem it, uh, but you're really limited about what you can do with that family at that point. So we became very interested in looking at working with families preemptively before the family got broken. And so um, we were allowed to start a parent mentor program where families could request a parent mentor, and it was faith-based, it's still happening, uh, so that maybe they, uh, when they are going through the system, that they can have someone to encourage the parent to make right choices and build a bigger community, which may even be a church family. So we do actually have two um, of our church family that came through that, that mentoring program. So the whole idea is to have a church family wrap around a family that's been in crisis so they have some long-term connections. So there's a lot you can do in the community that's not necessarily uh, faith-based, but boy, you can bring in your faith, and God, once again, is faithful. So you have to understand, I'm an engineer, so none of this makes sense, does it? I mean, it didn't to me, but, but we knew there was a need, we could meet it, and we needed to be faithful. So all of that comes together um, by the time Anna graduated, uh, and Pastor Byers um, was approached by the city to start the Community Development Corporation. I had all of that stuff in, 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 my, in my history, and um, he asked uh, me to become the director of the Community Del Development Corporation. So all of those things that God had been giving me opportunities to learn and to develop a passion for became in fruition with the CDC. And um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but you guys, and we are very thankful, have worked on our CDC project houses. So the CDC works on affordable housing projects, but we also want to do more, and that's to help stabilize and bring initiative to neighborhoods that are under-resourced, and that can be a variety of whatever that, that neighborhood might need. So, for example, we are actually, um, uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but we're worried about uh, not only developing houses, but also people. And you'll see why that's important in a little bit. And so, um, Nick said that we could, um, so I want you to kind of look back and, and see about how God was just walking me through all of the tools I needed to be able to serve um, at a time that the church family had another need. And the community had another need. It was also really cool, too, is because I was done with my homeschooling journey. And I had graduated. I'd had a year to kind of recover. <laughs> Not from her, but just, you know, <laughs> wrapping around, you know. And so, I mean, even his timing is perfect to, so that I was able to say yes to that opportunity. Uh, so I, there's a handout that Nick handed out. And those are a couple of resources that um, have impacted me greatly in um, our CDC work. 
and um, just my view of outreach to the community. So I would encourage you highly to do the World Magazine. Even there's a, an app that you can say um, in touch. It's kind of like Newsweek with a Christian worldview. But they have a lot of um, um, community outreach and um, faith-based approaches to um, social issues or uh, social services. And then the When Helping Hurts, <laughs> remember there are, I know you guys reading is not a good thing for you guys right now I get it um, I do promise you'll be able to read again I promise um, but so there are there are video clips that cover most of the material for the wind helping hurts so I would encourage you to at least view uh, two or three of those video clips even if you don't want to read the book um, so and then so Nick also said that if I was passionate about anything that I could share with you so now I get to, I get to do what Lori was to tell you about um, Oh, 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 I forgot to tell you before. This just, I read this tonight. So it, going back to being God, being faithful, I just read this today in my quiet time. So this is by Oswald, Cham Oswald Chambers. He says, The Lord has led me, and on looking back, we see the presence of an amazing design, which, if we are born of God, we'll credit, we will credit to God. Wow. Okay, so now here's what I want to talk about, my, my soapbox. So I am so grateful for the church leadership and Nick in leading you guys to be able to do community service. I know it's not convenient, and I know it's kind of been hard to come up with projects that fit the groups doing it, but um, as a recipient of that, I say thank you. And um, so I just want to help you kind of maybe think through of some things that I, that I have learned through my reading as you serve in the community. Um, so this is kind of a time for you to kind of wake up and talk to me. So when you think of people who are under-resourced, um, what would you think about those people in that category? If you, because typically when we're helping people in the urban area, they're, we would consider they're in poverty or they don't have as many resources. What would you guys, you just, if you were going to describe someone in that, what would be some words that you would use to describe them? You guys never thought about it? Yes. The powerless, okay. Hopeless, okay. Poor. poor, okay. Okay, so what would you define poor as then? They don't have enough money to sustain themselves the way they should be. Okay, so they don't have enough money. Lacking material needs, right. Okay, so um, mostly in, in North America, when we talk about people who are under resourced, it typically is in those material worlds. Um, and yes, it, it is a bigger thing. There's usually hopelessness and there's powerlessness, but normally we would define it as lacking material things. I think most of people would say that. Um, but um, <laughs> something's wrong because we've been fighting poverty in this country for over 50 years. In the 60s, there was great legislation that was called the War on Poverty, and that's when a lot of our social programs happened. Guess what? Our poor are in worse shape than when we started in the 60s. So something's not right. And I put to you that it is not only our definition of poverty, but it's also how we try to alleviate poverty. So if I can work this thing, aha. So uh, what I want to encourage you to think about is the fall, as in when Adam and Eve sinned, really did happen. And it happened in areas that sometimes I don't think we think about. And one of the big areas that it, it affected were our relationships. So not only our relationship with God, which is the big one, but also with um, each other, with ourselves, and with um, creation. And that had uh, devastating effects. Because what happened is there became a group that came up that tends to be a workaholic. So our relationship with the creation and understanding dominion and subduing the dominion is a little messed up. Um, we also have a group of people that think that everything that they have accomplished, they've kind of done on their own. They don't really think about God a whole lot, except maybe on Sundays. We have a group of people that um, have um, a very dysfunctional view of themselves, and our mental health issues um, have grown significantly and skyrocketed, skyrocketed since, the, since World War II. And it's probably not just because we're being diagnosed better. And they have a really high sense of self-worth. And so who do you think I've just described? 
uh, yeah, I would put to you it's the middle class Americans. That would be us. Now, then there's another group that tends to have a, a really marred self-image, and I'm not talking about they love themselves, but they just don't understand their identity and who they were supposed to be. They um, have a very weak understanding of their role in creation as far as they're supposed to subdue the, the creation and have dominion over it. And um, they have severe broken relationships with one another. So which group do you think I'm describing there? The poor, right. So um, both groups live under broken relationships. And what also happens is because there are broken people making up systems, as in not necessarily always government, governments, policies, um, culture, then the people also have to live within those broken systems. So my, my point to you is that being poor is a lot bigger deal than just lacking material things. And because they have those broken relationships, the lack of hope and the powerlessness because of the broken systems really come to affect their lives. And as we would know, the solution to that is, is who? It's Christ, right? Because he redeems all things. And he can repair these broken relationships. Whoopsies! Okay. I think it'll still work. So um, that's something to keep in mind when you're kind of working with the groups is uh, we are not their, their saviors and we are just as broken as they are. Our brokenness is just looks a little bit different. And they really struggle because we're in the middle class and the middle class gets to set up all the rules and the policies because we're the predominant culture. So it's really, they, I just call us functioning centers. That's what the middle class is. Okay. So... Um, then when you're trying to help people, so we get it that, that maybe poverty is a different definition than maybe what we think about it. And if you think about what the cause of it is, if it's not broken relationships, so if you think it's because they don't have enough education, what are you going to do with people? Give them education. If you think um, it's because of personal sin, and that's the only reason they're poor, what are you going to do with them? You're going to evangelize them and disciple them. If you think it's because systems are keeping them poor, what are you going to do? System. Yeah, you're going to be like a political activist or social justice. That's going to be your main thing. If you think, um, what's the other one? If you think it's just lack of stuff, what are you going to do? Yeah. Give them stuff. Well, I would point to you that most everyone has something of all four of those going on. And you need the wisdom of Solomon to discern what you need to do with those people. But what happens, like we mentioned North Americans tend to think poverty has to do with less lack of stuff. Well, they tend to move in the world of relief. They just want to keep giving people things. And if we give them things, then that's going to make them not poor anymore. And we know because of the broken relationships, that didn't work. So I would encourage you to think about when you're trying to help people that you maybe don't want to stay in the world of just what's called relief. You try to look for things that will develop them and help them learn what God says about those different relationships that they need to be understanding about. So, for example, uh, how many people really think random acts of kindness is really cool? It's a really fun thing to do. Right, okay? So, if you go give a homeless person a blanket or any of those four relationships, broken, any of those ro broken relationships worked on, Now, I'm not saying it's always wrong to do random acts of kindness, and they are fun, but who really is benefited by those random acts of kindness? Exactly, right. So, I think those are fine, but that shouldn't be the only drum we beat, the only tool in the toolbox. I think we need to look for things that we are actually going to be able to have a way to connect them long term so they can work on those relationships that are broken. Does that make sense? So, that's just one of my... my Soap boxes. So, um, so just so you know what uh, the, the CDC is doing, we are working on those affordable housing projects. And thank you, thank you for all of the help that you've always been on those projects. And we will keep on going, so we'll probably keep on calling. And we also do um, Jobs for Life and Faith and Finances. These are programs that pair um, folks in the urban area with a mentor. There's also instruction, but they work on helping people understand what 
their role is in creation. So Jobs for Life helps them understand that they are created by God with gifts and abilities and they are to be using those, God, those gifts to be productive in life to, so that they can support themselves and their family. And actually in Faith and Finances talks about that money is a tool to take care of their family and to serve others. And all of those are in the context of relationships where people help them do self-exploration to understand why they don't get those teachings. And then they're all, of course, um, gospel-centered so that they understand God is really in Christ is the only one that's the final solution to all of those. Uh, we also work with Benton School to achieve their initiatives. So we do child care for some of their programs and we do small clothing drives. And another role that we do is try to educate our church family about these, these sorts of things or other ways that they can serve uh, folks who are under-resourced. And one of the most amazing things we get to do this spring is in April, we're having what's called a cost of poverty simulation. And that's where participants go and they pretend they're a particular poor person. They assume the identity of a poor person. It's kind of like the game of life. So they're given this, um, every 15 minutes is supposed to be a week in their life and they're supposed to try to survive. So they may have to go to a probation officer, they may have to go and uh, um, apply for food stamps, they may be arrested, they may um, get a DUI, they may have to go to counseling. And um, so they try to figure out how to do life in those broken systems. And what's really interesting is you send middle class people to be the participants and they try to understand what it's like for the, the people who are under-resourced to truly actually try to survive. But what's really cool is we need volunteers to be those probation officers and those food stamp workers and those policemen. And that's what Nick is gonna volunteer you guys to get to do. So it's a Wednesday in April. We would love to have a full house. We need um, 20, 25 volunteers. And then we have up to uh, 72 spots in the actual program. And we only have 10 registered. It's a free program that United Way is coming to present. And I really think it would um, help all of our church family understand this problem more and I also want to have a good turnout because United Way is very gracious to come and do this for us for free. So that's all I wanted to share and I think Nick had some questions or it'll open it up for you guys to have some questions. Why did you be encouraged? Good. Just speak up, guys. Don't raise your hand. When I when I was encouraged by when you were speaking and how God had you in those various areas, and you saw a need. It wasn't just a thought of. I hope someone gets raised up to fill this area of need, and that someone um, is able to develop some sort of program so people can be helped out. But you and Jeff were able to. Uh, Build that and start different programs that help these people in these areas of need that you saw in various ways, and just uh, um, how God motivated you guys to act on 
these different sort of needs and desires that we're listening to. Yeah. Uh, I was encouraged to see the buildup of just the ways you started serving in small ways um, and that God ended up preparing you through that. And so in my life, it just it challenges me to be faithful with the small things I have now and then hope for something bigger in the future. Yeah, God doesn't waste anything. I was also encouraged um, just to see how long you and your husband and your family have been in this church and how many different areas um, you've served in. And it just always is amazing for me to see some of the adults in this church and how long they've been here and how much they've done. And, you know, it's just a really good encouragement and it's something that I, you know, I want to be able to So thank you for your example. Levi, you can be a PDF for 30 years. <laughs> And don't get me wrong, I mean, sometimes they need the blankets and the food. Sometimes after this talk, people think, oh, we should never give anybody anything. (laughs) Right, yeah, we we hope to do about three a year. So um, we need to do two more this year. Actually, the, the holdup is finding suitable um, houses for our project. So if you guys think about it, be praying that we could find, our, find some project houses. And then we just submitted an application to get money to do three more next year. So we hope we're in this for the long haul. Yeah. Uh, what does United Way do? Yeah, United Way is a... How would you explain United Way? They... Um, do a ton of stuff and they have different and focus groups so they're really um, they're really big in education um, that's kind of their strong suit in this area uh, and so they kind of um, get a bunch of money from all the people in the community and they pull it together and they support different agencies so like uh, the Boy Scouts they get some of the money to Boy Scouts they give it I don't I should remember who else is in there uh, I think Salvation Army's in there um, so those agencies go ahead and do their thing, and then United Way has some of their own initiatives that they do. And so they have um, taxes that they do for the, the, the low-income people. They actually are doing some initiatives in the school. They do a get ready for kindergarten camp. They do a born learning program, which is actually what we do the child care for at Benton to teach um, families how to engage with their preschoolers so that they're ready to go to school. Um, and the, the Bodayas actually are going to be the spokespeople for that program, so that's exciting. Um, I need to bug the Bodayas to come do childcare with us at Vinton. Um, and um, I, I, they used to do uh, vocational training. They will do some um, some scholarships to get people into college. So they tried it. They, they have a, a thing called from cradle to career. So they try. They really do work hard on the development stuff too. They're probably not very much on the relief end. Um, you said at one point something along the lines of like when you get busy in ministry, your spiritual gifts become like really evident. Can you like explain what you meant by that a little more? Well, I'm, and I'm not saying it's wrong, but a lot of times people take those spiritual gift tests, and those, and I think those reveal things. But for me, it became very obvious when I would start serving. Uh, so say we would, you know, do a meal. You know, my brain would be like oh my word, if we did this, this would be better. And, you know, we really should call people to make sure this happens next time. So I was planning and organizing, which, 
you know, obviously that became the school, uh, this gift of administration. So what I think a lot of people spend so much time, like I was doing, thinking, oh, the nursery needs the gift of mercy, so I, I can't serve there. Where my pastors were asking us to fulfill a need that I, we could do. So what I'm saying is that uh, for us, as we were serving, the things that really got you going, I mean, you know when something's really clicking, that was the stuff, oh, this is administration, this is what I'm doing. For other people, you know, in the nursery who are rocking the babies, they get really excited. Well, they're the gift of mercy. But most of our ministries, and you'll find probably even in small churches, are so big, you're going to need all gifts in all, in all ministries. So it could be just something that you think is really exciting, but if you're serving, then you're going to be able to use that gift in that area. Did that answer your question? Help with their broken relationships in the far as the families, you mean? Yeah, or, or how would we be able to help address it? Well, uh, there's a variety of ways. Like in the community, I could see a college student working with big brothers, big sisters, because um, typically when young people um, don't have good mentors, they tend to look for um, relationships in the wrong place and affirmation in the wrong place. And so typically that will start the cycle of um, single mothers and deadbeat dads kind of thing. And so uh, being a, a child of a single mom, your risk of poverty is like 23 times like more prevalent. So uh, single motherhoodness, not that it's wrong. I mean, they, kept the, they didn't kill the baby and we need to support single moms, but that just is a high risk fac factor for poverty. So anything where you could break the cycle of single mothering is a good thing. So that would be a practical way in the community that a college student could do because being a cool college student and being a big brother, I mean, talk about points that would get <laughs> these boys' attention. You could get their attention very easily. Um, and then as far as one another, I would say I would really encourage people to understand what a godly family looks like and encourage one another to develop the practices now in serving brothers and sisters in Christ so that in the family that's just the natural extension of what you're going to keep on doing in your family. Yeah. yeah. Who's the new director? Ron is not doing it anymore? Ron is not. Um, his name is Chris, I believe. Is that right, Aaron? Chris, I his last name. Um, I'm behind Ron the times. So, um, yeah, so if you're a guy and you're interested in that, come talk to Aaron, right? Because they reached out to us for help. Um, the other piece I was going to say. Okay, and can I interrupt real quick? There is a faith based uh, component in Big Brother and Big Sister, so you don't even have to, like, dance around that. I mean, if the parent signs up the kid for the faith-based one, the topic of faith is... Right, yeah. Yep. So you can share the gospel. Right? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, and then the other thing, building off of what you said about um, working with other college students, is invite them to your home. If you grew up in a home where uh, it's a Christian family and relationships are good, then invite them over for a meal. Take them home for a week and let them see your family dynamic um, so they can get a taste of what that's like and want that. That would be my mm -hmm. So it's a good one. Easter, holidays, whatever it may be, like if you're going home, invite some people that you know and don't have the greatest home life and they would be willing to come to your place. 
And our home is always open. Like if you're away from home and you want to bring someone, please bring them. We always have, we used to have holiday kids that would come, but they've moved on. So we would love to have holiday kids again. Yeah, <laughs> my family would would say there were a lot of tears and weeping and gnashing of teeth sometimes. I mean, it was perfectly honest. Some of the stuff I didn't want to do. I mean, I, 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 you know, the foster parenting. I was like, oh yeah, yeah. But I mean, people, God put people in our lives that were fostering, and we were working with a family who was, you know, they were disintegrating in front of our eyes, and I saw what it was doing with the kids, and I'm thinking. How can I, with a home with plenty of bedrooms and um, time on my hands and experiencing parenting and having taught three and four year olds and nursery forever, um, why couldn't I, why shouldn't we invest in these children? So I think um, God always brought people into my life that really made me understand if I'm going to love these people, this is what I need to do next. But yeah, it would, no, no, it was never this. <laughs> Sanitized. <laughs> Thank you. Got it? All right. I don't want to have a feedback. I don't want to kill you guys. Um, all right, so that's our first of six. Hopefully that was really helpful and encouraging to you. Um, at least gets you thinking about how you can use the gifts and abilities, the passions that God has put in your life um, to serve him as well. Here's the thing that I really want to reemphasize from her testimony. Um, the only way that she and her family were able to do any of this stuff, to be able to be used by the Lord in this way, is to first have a relationship with God, uh, a relationship with her, his son, Jesus Christ, um, and you can probably notice that that's where her whole starting of the speech was, was at a young age, she trusted Christ, um, and that changed her life. So, what does that matter for you? Well, that's a key part of anyone's testimony. Um, it's really hard to have a testimony if you don't know the Lord. We can't live out our purpose um, that God's created us for, can't use the gifts, the passions, the abilities that he's designed us for if we don't know him, if we don't have a relationship with him. And Scripture does make it very clear that it is possible to have a relationship with God um, multiple times throughout Scripture. Um, it's, it uses terminology like son of God, daughter of God, co-heir with Christ. These, these words to identify people who choose to trust in Christ as in a relationship with him. Um, so maybe you're here tonight and you're thinking, what do I need to do like, to have a testimony like that? Well, it starts by placing your faith in Christ. Um, the Apostle Paul, I'm going to share real quickly here, that he makes it pretty clear in his letter to the Romans. And if you've been here before, you've heard this, but um, this is a key piece to testimonies, this is a key piece to the Christian faith. Um, in the book of Romans, Paul tells us this, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And guess what? That encompasses everyone in the room. None of us are excused from that sentence, that judgment. Um, and then later he says that the wages of sin is death. So if we've all sinned, that means we all deserve death. Um, and it's not just talking about a physical death. It's talking about a spiritual death as well, a separation from God. So thankfully, though, God doesn't leave us there. Uh, we read that at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And so even though we were his enemies, he sent his son to die for us. And because of that, we have the hope, this free gift of eternal life through Christ if we place our faith and our trust in him. And the way that we do that, uh, he tells us in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Um, so it is possible for you and for me and for everyone here tonight to have a testimony like Mrs. Walters, a testimony of God rescuing you out of darkness and bringing you into the kingdom of his beloved son. But that starts at a point in time with a choice that you make 
to confess Jesus as Lord and to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So that's the good news. That's what it takes to have a testimony. And then it gets even better after that because in Romans 8.1 we hear that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so we have the hope of being eternally justified in God's sight with the promise of heaven. So if you want to use your passions, your gifts, your abilities uh, to serve the Lord, to bless others, you got to start there. That's, that's the starting stone, uh, placing your faith in Christ. But maybe you're here tonight and you're a believer. What does that look like for you then? How do you take the next step? Well, guess what? Spring break's coming, right? You're, you're on spring break right now. Classes are over. So what steps are you going to take this week to begin using your gifts, using your passions, using your abilities for God's glory as you serve others? Um, take us back a few weeks to the Great Commission when Aaron shared out of Matthew 28. We're to go and make disciples. And we do that by teaching them, um, by sharing the good news. But a lot of times you're not even going to have the opportunity to share the good news if you're not, for, you're not first serving them. You, they need to know that you care about them, that you love them. Um, and so you can do that in your words and your actions um, with the hope of getting the chance to share the good news of Christ with them. So on spring break, who are you going to be around? Family, friends, other PBFers maybe? What are their needs? You've got to be thinking about that. How can I meet those needs? What gifts, what abilities, what talents has God given you that will allow you to meet the needs of the other peoples that you're around? Whether it's your family, whether it's your friends or your peers. You can do something about that on spring break. So, what if you're going on the PBF trip? What if you're going down to Tennessee? Maybe it's getting out of bed at a decent hour in the morning and looking for ways that you can serve the other people around you. What if you're at home? Same principle. Get up early. Be there when your mom and dad get up. Maybe do the laundry while they're away at work. Do the simple things. Do the easy things, but things that are a blessing to them. And if you're, especially if your parents or your siblings aren't believers, then you have an opportunity through those acts of love, through those words of love, to share the gospel with them, to share why you're doing them, uh, to explain what motivates you. If you're in Tennessee um, or going to another trip somewhere else with another group, um, I would encourage you to make it your mission that no one is left out, uh, that no one feels like they're excluded, um, but instead... You love them, and you want them to be a part of whatever you're doing that day. Um, and so you're reaching out to them. You're encouraging them. You're making the conversation go beyond the superficial uh, to really what matters in life, and you're getting down into the dirt with them and really loving on them in that way, walking through things together. So you guys know what you're doing for spring break. I don't know what all of you are doing. I don't know what all of your gifts and talents and abilities are, um, but you do. So I would encourage you just be thinking about what does that look like this next week. 